It must be understood that everything we do here in time is traceable to the consistent ministry of Him that is in the heavens. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. Let's try to understand that scripture very well. Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. Is anybody there in Philippians chapter 1 verse 19? First of all, it's making us to understand that terrible situations might come from the external, from the environment. But if you are secured in God and you are operating within the context of the will of God, God has a way of turning those situations for your good. And that reality comes to pass because prayer was offered and in response to the prayer, there was a supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I think we need to dwell on that for a while. The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And if you were there in the study yesterday, you know that the basis for the outpouring of the Spirit is that we have what? A king priest that is in the heavens. If you were here, you know that. Amen? Now it is necessary for us to understand that we realize the reality of Christ in terms of the Spirit. Now say it so that you can, you can, you can enter. We realize the reality of Christ in terms of spirit. Now, you walk, you are a staff of the federal government, but after you finish your 30 days work, you have to go to a bank to get your salary. Then also, which bank do you go to? Don't worry, nobody will meet you there. We will be waiting for you at the door. <laughs> You'll be, all right. He works for 30 days for the federal government. And after this time is accomplished, he goes to UBA to receive his money. What happens at the bank is a realization of his input. And do you realize that he doesn't work at the bank? That's not where his duty post is. His duty post is somewhere else. But he goes to the bank in order for that which he has imputed to be realized. Christ is the administrator of all of God's divine purposes and eternal plans. But everything that Christ has procured can only be realized in terms of spirit. Now you must understand this. Everything that Christ has purchased, everything that Christ has made available on the account of his sacrifice can only be realized in terms of spirit. And that's why when religion comes into the body of Christ, it robs us of the reality of Christ. Amen. Because we don't realize Christ in terms of religion. We realize Christ in terms of spirit. And so every true spiritual thing that you are doing that is striking a chord in heaven has an impact in terms of spirit, not in terms of flesh. Are you still with me now? So Paul is saying that, you know, he was in some crisis and he was, he was asking the brethren to pray for him. He was assured of the fact that the brethren were praying for him. And because of that, he knew that the situation was ultimately going to turn in his favor. Because of the prayers of the brethren, that's number one, and because of the supply of the Spirit of Christ. The second element upon which his assurance was based is intrinsically related to the operation of the king priest in the heavens. Just in case you were here yesterday, you understand what that means. The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ is dependent upon the operation of the king priest in the heavens. And that was why when in Ephesians chapter 4, when God began to speak to us that we have received grace by reason of the measure of Christ that is in us, and then he connected that reality to 
ascension. These are the things that that verse actually means. The supply of the Spirit. Amen? So all the bounties of God, everything that God wants to give you, and everything that God indeed is giving to you, comes to you in terms of Spirit, not in terms of anything that is natural. It comes what? In terms of what? Spirit. Now if God has decided to transmit His bounties to us in terms of Spirit, then we must be able to understand when, at what point we have received from God. Amen? Now, if we have prayed to God, if we have ministered to God, and God responds in terms of spirit, not in terms of flesh, not in terms of our senses, He he responds what? In terms of spirit. So we must understand how to design the response of God. Are you still with me now? How to what? Design the response of God. There's one among us, a married woman. I didn't know she was going through all that trouble. Um, anytime we finish from here and she goes home, the husband begins to quarrel her that. What kind of meeting do you go for? And it becomes another thing entirely. Hallelujah. And somehow she was convinced that her destiny was connected to what we're doing. And, um, well, at the end of the day, the husband doesn't get to ban her from coming, so she still keeps coming. But she knows that if she gets back every day, there's going to be some crisis in the house. Amen? And then... That situation was, became an object of prayer for her. So as she spoke to God about her current crisis, I need you to understand that God's response is going to be, first of all, in terms of what? Spirit. God is going to respond and give an assurance to the woman by reason of the supply of the Spirit. Now, it's not every time that God... God doesn't change circumstances first. He changes you first. And so, she noticed that after a point, when the husband begins to scold and scold, it no longer affects her. The reason is because she has changed. And what occasion that change is that there has been a supply of the spirit of grace. The grace of God has been released in order for her to go through that situation and not feel the impact. Have you ever been there before? There was a strange crisis around your life. God did not come instantly to change the situation, but He just released grace upon you. And at a point in the crisis, you were no longer feeling the impact. What happened to you was that you have received the supply of the Spirit of grace upon your life. And so if a man is not diligent to really assess his condition, he may not know that God was actually actively involved in his deliverance. Are you with me? Because we do not realize the benefits of God in terms of the mind, in terms of circumstances. It is realized in terms of spirit, in the privacy of the core of our being. That's where God releases the support that will enable us um, go through natural life situations. Sometimes it changes the situations and sometimes it gives us strength to be able to go through the situation. Now, it is needful for us also to understand that when pressure is brought to bear upon a man, when pressure is brought to bear upon a man, somehow the impact of that pressure is revealed in several emotional Windows, like the impact of pressure can be the reason for fear. The impact for pressure can be the reason for anxiety. The impact for pressure can be the reason for worry. All these are human manifestations to pressure. Are you with me now? Human manifestation. There's worry, there's fear, there's sorrow, there's anxiety. All these are symptoms of the impact of pressure on a human being. And actually, these are manifestations of his insufficiency. These are manifestations of the fact that he cannot expect to depend upon himself 
to actually live out his life. Because when pressure comes upon him, he begins to manifest his insufficiencies in terms of fear, in terms of anxiety, in terms of worry, in terms of grief. Amen? But, when God wants to intervene in that situation, what he does is that he supplies his spirit. And suddenly in situations where this guy would have been afraid, he's bold. In situations where this guy would have been anxious, he's full of assurance. In situations where this guy would have been troubled, he's full of hope. The same situation, it didn't change, but there was a supply on the inside that was sufficient enough to swallow up the symptoms of, his, of the insufficiencies of his humanity. Did you get to that point? I want you to really understand the supernatural life. Because this abundant life is not trouble free. Please help me tell your neighbor. Abundant life is not trouble free. Please help me tell him again that faith makes it possible. It doesn't make it easy. But that's what it means when we say something is supernatural. Your response to the situation is not natural because there has been a supply of a divine element. And if you are not careful, you will not actually discern that God has been supporting you through the situation. You will think that it's because of your skills that is happening. If you are not, if you are not careful, you will not remember to give thanks. Remember, in any situation, the first thing that God does in response to your prayer, or in response to your worship, in response to your petition, is that He supplies the Spirit. And the proof that His Spirit has been supplied is that you have ability to stand in the situation and not manifest the insufficiencies of humanity. That's a proof that He has been responding. Because if not for that response, a lot of us would have been caught up in hypertension. There are several things that happen to you on a daily basis. Some victories you walk in on a daily basis which is owing to the supply of the spirit of grace. That you may not know that it's God that is doing it. You may not know that it's supernatural because He imparts that grace to make up for the insufficiencies of the natural. So you operate in a fashion that is a little bit above the natural because there's a supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. I met a woman, she has four, uh, four children. One is a boy, and the other three are girls. So she lavished all her love on that young man. And you know, when parents and particularly mothers lavish their love on one particular child like that, the devil will mark that child too. Mm, even though he might be the only girl around, he, he might be the only boy around, train them the same way. And, uh, you know, so he is full of the fact that if he should cry, the mother will look for money and give him because he's not supposed to be crying. He has a wrong philosophy of life. Until he went to campus, he had a little bit more money than the average student. Not even a little bit, he had a lot of money. Because the mother said, this boy should not cry. Now, because he had um, extra money, the court guys were able to spot him that if they can make him one of them, the organization will be funded. So by the time he was in 200 level, he was already a uh, pawn. Not because he was strong and courageous, but he was funding several things. And people were running stuff for him. Until they clashed with another group. And, and those groups were a little bit more spiritual than them. You know, the battles of life always tilt. Life is not fair. Life always tilts in the direction of the spiritual weight. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> and those guys now went diabolical because they knew that they could not stand the court he was part of naturally. So they went supernatural. And suddenly, he came out of a lecture room and complained of headache and headache, headache, and he died. Now, the moment that boy died, the mother also began to die. Because there was no supply of the spirit of grace. The first symptom she had was hypertension. From hypertension to stroke. 
and then from stroke some of her organs began to fail because there was worry which is a manifestation of humanity is worry a sin it's just human and she manifested in worry and stayed in worry and stayed in worry and her organs the first thing that we respond is your heart and then your liver and then your kidney and then all the organs inside began to fail and in the next one year the lady died because she had no supply of the spirit of grace and i know that most of you have passed through more difficult situations and you are still, your liver is still functioning. And your kidney is still okay. <laughs> Something was working with you. So I, I, I would like us to be able to design the supernatural God. He will not come like thunder to strike something. But he is always supplying something that is giving you a little bit more impute for you to go through the things you go through and come out untouched. And that is a possibility because there is a kingly priest that is ministering into your spirit. Did you get it? Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. Then number three, we are going to consider him within the context of the divine priest. He is not just a kingly priest. He is also a divine priest. And the context of his operation as the divine priest is in the heavens. And so it's is one of the issues that satisfies the things that we are studying. The divine priest. The divine priest. Amen? And the reference scripture for that reality is in the book of Hebrews chapter 7. The divine priest. Hebrews chapter 7. Are you with me in Hebrews chapter 7? In Hebrews chapter 7 um, Can we begin to read from verse 11 to verse 16? Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For him of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, and of which tribe Moses spoke nothing according to the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. So the basis of his priesthood is not according to a fleshly law, but the basis of his priesthood in the heavens is according to the power of a life that is endless. That is according to the divine life. Are you still with me? The basis of his priesthood is according to the divine life. That was where I got the divine priesthood from. So it's not just a kingly priesthood, it is also a divine priesthood because the basis upon which it's established is the power of the divine life, the endless life, the everlasting life. That is the basis of his priesthood. Amen? So we are going to look at what it means when we say he operates a divine priesthood. And what has that got to do with us? How does it impact on our daily living? We must understand that Christianity is life applicable. And every reality and every revelation that you receive must have a capacity and an appendage 
to impact upon your daily living. If we have not translated it to that point, it's still in the realm of philosophy. And it doesn't have the capacity to change our experience and our walk upon the face of the earth. So we have captured him and we have recognized him to be a divine priest. And we must understand the implication of that reality and how it impacts upon our daily life. Are you still with me? Hallelujah. So his priesthood is predicated on the power of a life that is endless. It's dependent on the power of a life that is what? Is endless. Now, can you turn your Bible with me to Romans chapter, seven, uh, chapter 5 and then we'll begin to open some scriptures then you, you understand. Now, wait, 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 wait. You are in a hurry. You are in a hurry. It's obvious that you are not getting me. When we consider Jesus as a divine priest whose priesthood is established upon the power of an endless life, what we are trying to consider is that the only cure for death is life. Just hold that in your mind. You need to know that if we function in the flesh, we die. So the death that Adam was sentenced to, that death is still in our flesh today. Just in case there's a situation on ground and I'm reaching back into the resources of my mind, reaching back into the resources of my learning, reaching back into the resources of my human strength to make that situation good, just in case that situation was orchestrated from the realm of the spirit, these elements that are brought to confront the situation will not have the ability to change it because there's no life in those things that I'm depending on. There's no life in my thoughts. Are you with me? There's no life in my human ability. And if I'm going to combat death, then I must combat death with an element that is superior to death, an element that existed before death came. And there's only one thing that is superior to death, has more authority than death, because it existed before death came, and that's the divine life. The divine life is indestructible because it was not created. And because of that, you must understand that the divine life existed before death was established, before death found expression on the account of disobedience. Do you get what I'm talking about? So, divine life will still be life, even in the presence of death. And that's why, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, I need to show us a few things here. Um, when they were to come out of Egypt, there was an instruction that they should sacrifice a lamb and to put his blood around their houses. The implication of that was what we call the principle of substitution. So the lamb gave his life, he gave his freedom. I, I hope you know that at that point in time, the angel of death was about to scout through the land. So substitution had taken place. The lamb, the lamb gave his life so that the firstborn in Goshen would be free. When the angel of death came into Egypt, the angel of death noticed that the firstborns in Goshen had already died before he came. So that's why he passed over. Because in his eyes, every firstborn died. Only that before he came to Goshen, the firstborn of the Israelites have already been killed before he showed up. So there was no need for him to operate there. But actually, the principle that went forth, the principle that was adopted, was a principle of substitution. And that is illustrative of that which Christ did for us on the cross. Amen? So Christ came and gave us his life. And I need you to understand that Christ's life is, was not created so it cannot be destroyed. Do you get it? So we received eternal life in Egypt on the account of substitution. Amen? Oh, you are not with me. I'm trying to make you understand Romans chapter 5. If we go to Romans chapter 5, without this background, you don't understand it, and you don't understand the implication of the divine priest. And everything pertaining to ministry that we are involved with upon the face of the earth is dependent upon the reality and the understanding of his ascension. 
Did you get it? So when we understand his ascension, because that's where ministry has come from. That's where our calling has come from. That's where our anointing is coming from. If we do not understand the scope of the ascension accurately, we may not be able to understand the basis upon which ministry is established. So when substitution took place, there was an exchange of life. And on the cross, there was an exchange of life because Christ died in our place. He took on our sentence and died for our sentence. So we are going to assume his life and live his life. But it happens to be that the life that he has is eternal. So in Egypt, when that lamb was crucified, that lamb was sacrificed, they had received life eternal. So when the angel of death came, the angel of death could not operate in Goshen, even though judicially, the angel recorded that every firstborn in the province of Egypt died, judicially. And the explanation for the death in Goshen was overtaken by a principle of substitution. But so judicially, every firstborn died. But actually, substitution was taken, took place, and then the firstborns in Goshen had taken the life of the lamb. And the life of that lamb is eternal. You get it? Good. Now, Israel was allowed to go. Egypt was angry. Egypt began to follow. And there was only one way for them to be separated. They had to go through baptism. And if you have gone through your Bible in the book of Romans critically, you will find out that baptism means death. The understanding of the fact that I, have, I, 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 I died in Christ has come to me. That's why I'm going for baptism. Sorry, baptism means burial. The understanding that I died in Christ has come to me. That's why I surrender myself for baptism. Now, so these guys, so baptism means what? Burial. So these guys, as they were coming and Egypt was following them behind, they said, okay, let us all go to, through burial. Let's die. Let everybody die. That's why they went through the water. And as they went through the water, they had already received eternal life which is a life that is superior to death. That life existed in heaven even before death was speak of. So when eternal life was faced with death, death had no authority over it. So the children of Israel could go through death and still be alive because they had eternal life. But the Egyptians that did not have eternal life, they went through death and death had authority over them. So when we talk about the divine priesthood, that is predicated upon an endless life, you must understand that the crisis here is a war against death. Did you get it? And I'm going to show you from the book of Romans chapter 5. Before I go there, before I go there, let's do some small law. Now, salvation has a legal aspect and then an organic aspect. Amen? Now, first, we need to consider the legal aspect of salvation before we consider the organic aspect. When I say organic, it's just a chemistry word which means a life-giving aspect. That's what organic is. So, salvation has what? A legal aspect and it has what? A life-giving aspect. Amen? So, I, I, we need to consider the legal aspect. Well, that will take our time if we consider the legal aspect. Because we need to understand the claims of divine justice. Because divine justice had claims on the account of the sin of Adam. If Adam had given birth to children before he sinned, eh, it would have been a different case. But all of us were still inside of him when he sinned. And the sin that he committed, the impact of that sin was imputed to every one of us. But if he had given birth to children before he sinned, God wouldn't have... Salvation would have been in a, in a different way. God would have just continued with another lineage. But the whole human race was inside of Adam. And was going to come out of Adam. And when Adam had corrupted his seed, everyone that was in him was corrupted also. So if you were born and you came out of Adam, you have the same corruption that Adam has received. 
If Adam had eaten of the tree of life, immediately you are born, naturally you will be born again. <laughs> oh, you, you, didn't, you didn't hear me. Are you with me? If Adam had received that tree of life and eaten the tree of life, he would have become recreated, he would have become born again. The Spirit of God would have taken residence on his inside and that would have been his fashion. And if he gives birth to any child, the child will be after his kind and that child would have been born again. But Adam sinned before he was able to produce. So everyone that came out of him was corrupted. And the realm of the laws of divine justice had claims on man. Claims. So there had to be a judicial aspect of salvation. That's why the word redemption is a legal word. The word justification is a legal, is a legal word. Because the reality of justification can only be actualized in the court of law. When the judge says you are discharged and acquitted, that is justification. So all those things are legal and you find most of those things in the book of Romans because the book of Romans gave us a display of the judicial aspect of salvation which is responsible for the organic aspect of salvation. But for the purpose of our lecture this morning, I want to focus on the organic aspect because the divine priest has a ministry that is established on the power of the endless life. So it has to do with the life-giving aspect of our redemption. The organic side of our salvation. And then you are going to see, and then you are going to be able to um, realize the war between life and death and how God has supplied that endless life into us as a means of swallowing death in our universe. Did you get it to that point? It's going to be more technical, so I want you to follow. Amen? Are you following? You are following. Now, see, I assure you that as you are listening to this lecture now, you will not be able to get 40% of it just listening. These are core issues of our Christian faith that will guarantee that your life operates the way God has said it will operate, irrespective of territory, irrespective of the limitations that are around you, your life will be able to produce the results that are recommended in Scripture if you understand the economy that supports it. Amen? So I will still advise us from the first lesson we had, the first lecture we had, just get the message and take one month to hear it very well so that your mind can be renewed, your mind can experience what we call reset to accommodate this reality. Amen? Do you have a handset? In your handset, there's one function when you open to settings. There's one function called restore to factory setting. Have you seen that function? Have you played enough with your handset to find that one? Restore what? To factory setting. That option is there. Because you can personalize your handset. You give it your own kind of welcome note. You give it your own kind of wallpaper. You give it your own kind of ringtone. Your own kind of team. And then, just in case you lose track of the whole thing, you can still restore. Now, so there are times where we actually need resetting. When we encounter the truth of God's word, our mind must be renewed to accommodate that truth and then it is installed like a software that influences our thought pattern along the line of that truth. So you will need to get the tape because you can't get all in one class. Now it took me several years to receive utterance from God to be able to teach what I'm teaching. Not that I didn't know it before, but I couldn't even explain it because the wisdom to explain it was not there. It's, you know, it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to have wisdom to be able to communicate it. So the wisdom was not there and the utterance was not there. But recently, God began to bring utterance and wisdom. And um, as much as I would like you to understand it in trying to simplify it, you will need to really listen to it so that 
it can be installed in you like a software that runs your mind. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 5. But I, I want to see if we can finish the thing about the heavens. So that when we get back, we'll go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay? And then when we get there, you'll be able to understand now when the Bible says he gave some to be apostles. You understand the context. He gave some to be prophets. He gave some to be pastors. He gave some to be teachers. Then we'll be able to explain that. you understand that. Then when I take you to Revelation chapter 1, and you see the symbol, the prophetic symbol that is in Revelation chapter 1 about Christ and His ministry, you just get it, bam, one time. Hallelujah. It's needful for us to understand that there are 26 core revelations of the heavenly Christ in the book of Revelation. 26. And it's also needful for you to know that the book called the Bible is the book concerning Christ and his kingdom. Everything in that book is a testimony concerning a div- an eternal personality. Do you realize when Jesus was speaking to those guys at Emmaus, those disciples that were backsliding, the Bible says he began to show them himself in the scripture. True Bible studies to be able to study the Bible and to see Christ in Scripture. I'm going to give you an, an example. So I show you how to study the Bible so that you can draw life from it. Not just studying so that you can feed your mind, but studying so that you can draw life. I know several people that know the Scriptures a lot. They quote it and all of that. You can bamboozle them with the Bible, but they don't have life. <laughs> because they were using the Scriptures as feed stock for their mind. But through the scriptures we should be able to access life. Because Jesus said the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So if we cannot access life, we are living short of scriptural reality. Living short of the gift that God has given to us by allowing each and every one of us to have a Bible. Through that we can enter into the realm of life. We can enter into the realm of reality. And I trust God that that will be a portion of everybody in Jesus' mighty name. In the book of Romans chapter 5, my emphasis is actually verse 10, but we'll just read from verse 6. For when we were still with our strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet per- perhaps for a good man someone will dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more. Now, uh, you see, I'm troubled now. Calm down. Should I g- tell you a secret? Anytime you saw the book of Romans and you see much more, stop. Don't read again. Just stop. What does much more mean? Dan. Much more. Now, let us try to find out what is earlier stated so that we can, we can now key in with the much more. Amen? Because the first part of the scripture, the first part of what we read is relating to judicial salvation. Because the Bible is saying that Christ died for the ungodly. Then, in order to satisfy the claims of divine justice. But you see, he's saying that much more than substitution, much more than taking your place in death so that you can have life, much more than that, salvation is much more than that. Come with me. But God de- demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified. That's why I say that word justification is in the court of law. On the account of Christ's sacrifice, God the Father has looked upon us and called us discharged and acquitted. 
You see, having now, because the resultant effect of the sacrifice is that we are now recipients of God's justification. Having now been justified by His blood, and His blood was required so that the claims of divine justice will be satisfied. We have, be, we have been saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through His death, judicial, alright, to the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. This aspect is organic. Are you seeing? So we see the judicial aspect, which was accomplished by the blood, and then the organic aspect, which will be accomplished by the receipt, continual receipt of his life. And I said that his divine ministry is predicated upon the fact that he is a custodian of what? An endless life. Are you following? Now, I'm trying to make you understand what that life, that endless life that you have received. Because the Bible says that we will be saved by that life. Just as we were saved by the blood, we are still going to have to be saved by the life. Now, 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 you see, that is going to bring some form of confusion, so I need to explain. We were saved by the blood. And now we are heaven bound. Amen? But I need you to understand that you are spirit, soul, and body. Is that true? I say, is that true? Now, because a lot of scholars say you are spirit, you have a soul, you possess a soul, and you dwell in a body. A lot of scholars say that. But in my own study of scripture, I didn't find that. Every time God spoke about man, if I take you to First Thessalonians, you're going to see, they say, God will sanctify you, holy, spirit, soul, and body. Man is trapatite. God is trapatite. And in any day and in any realm, you will still have a body. When we leave this body, you will have another body. Which is called the glorified body. The type that Jesus had when resurrected. You will still be spirit, soul, and body. And salvation is supposed to affect these three departments. It is because of that reality that the temple was constructed with three columns. Outer court, inner court, and holy place. Because that temple is you. So if you define man, anything short of these three compartments, I think we have a trouble. Because God's intention is to allow the impact of your salvation to affect not just your spirit, not just your soul, but also your body. The spirit is the place where that must have authority and that's where your life should be directed from, your, your life should be ordered from. Your spirit should be in the lead because that's where the Holy Spirit dwells. That's God's command tower. Then your soul will receive instruction from your spirit and your body will receive instruction from your soul and that is the kind of alignment that is expected. But the house that is divided against itself shall not stand. That means if your soul is not subject to the authority of your spirit and your body is not subject to the authority of your soul, maybe your body controls the thing. The loss in your body is controlling your, your universe. What it will produce will not be the will of God. If your soul is controlling your universe, your intellect, your brain, your craftiness, your own way is controlling your universe, your life will not produce God's expectation. Are you still with me? None of the faculties can be left out of the process of sanctification. Did you get it? Now, watch it. When you gave your life to Christ, Christ was smuggled and he began to tabernacle in your spirit. But he was not living in your soul. He was not living in your body. So, the same mindset you had when you were an unbeliever, still have it. If you, if you drank beer, star, very well those days, when you pass by the beer parlor and you smell star, you still recognize it. Are you still with me? Or you don't want me to enter that area? Amen? 
People that were into women a lot, and you give your life to Christ, God knows that if He leaves you in that state, He will look for women again. So He has to carry out a sanctification that will affect that appetite that has been enlarged and bring it back to sight so that your body can yield to the instructions coming from your soul. Are you still with me? So the truth is that there is death in your body. <laughs> Paul says that in me, that is in my flesh or in my body, my appetites do not fulfill the will of God. So if I give in to sex, the will of God will be trampled upon. If I give in to drinking, not even Vietnam, the Lord wants me to stay on a fast and my whole body is saying, oh boy, there's test. So you know that the system that governs the appetite in my body is not controlled by my spirit. It's not controlled by the Holy Ghost. It's controlled by something else. And it's only the spirit that can impart life. So any other thing that controls my body, if I yield to it, I will end up in death. So there's a battle of life and death that is in your universe. And only the power of that endless life that death could not swallow in Egypt, that death could not swallow in the Red Sea, only the power of that endless life can begin to conquer territories in your universe until your entire being is sanctified holy, spirit, soul, and body. Are you following me? I'm, I, I, I'm going to take time to explain that so that you begin to understand. Like, those of you that were fighters, you used to fight. If somebody should do something, you fight so much those days, and you gave your life to Christ, people will still offend you. And you still feel like fighting. Because the old mindset is there. There's still death in the system. But when the guy begins to walk with God and walk with God, then the sanctification process continues. The power of that endless life begins to swallow up that death. A time will come in that person's life where when those things, people offend him like that, he doesn't feel like fighting anymore because he has experienced sanctification by the endless life that is rejuvenated on his inside. Do you realize that even if you are under the spell of lust, and you take a fast and begin to pray and begin to pray. A time will come where the power of that life will swallow that death and your body will be aligned. With it. And do you realize that that life is constantly being supplied into your spirit to overflow your spirit, influence your soul, influence your body? That life is consistently being supplied because there is a divine priest in the heavens. That releases life all across every member of the body of Christ. Of those that are in heaven and of those that are on earth. And it's that overflow of life that continues the process of sanctification, separating every element and every potential that you have to the use of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that you, you right now you are not the man that you used to be before? Because sanctification. That your temperament has even changed to a great extent. Is it true? Because I used to be an angry man. Because I was a stammerer. So, you know, stammering and anger were, were compatible. But God will look at that man and God will call him my man. Even with the anger. Because God has confidence in his life. That as that life continues to sanctify him, a time will come where the anger will be swallowed up. Especially if you are cooperating with God to hand him over the anger. It's easy for the, the chainsaw of God's endless life to cut it off. And the sanctification continues. The sanctification continues. Until a point comes where somebody that used, was used to women before has been so sanctified that he is as if he's a virgin. He, 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 no, he's no longer used to the smartness he had to corner ladies. Now that he wants to marry, he doesn't even have the vocabulary to stand before a lady. And do you understand? Something has happened to him. It's the life of God that is eating up every trace of death. I've seen guys before, men before that their wives died, and they didn't even find the ability to talk to a lady again to marry. I've seen men like The ability had been eaten. <laughs> Because of the power 
of what an endless life. I assure you, you are better today than you were some time ago. Maybe you have not been careful enough to notice it, but my own has been quite drastic. And that's why when, you, when, when people come to the Lord, don't look at their limitations. Don't look at... Don't be religious. Alright? Give them time. You don't even need to preach a sermon to attack them. No, it's not necessary. Allow the process of sanctification to continue by the power of that endless life. It has the power to eat up death. And in its place, it will replace it with life. Very soon, you begin to see the person's disposition, the person's mindset, the person's approach towards issues, the person's counsel, totally different from what it used to be. Because sanctification continues, spirit, soul, and body. Somebody will ask, I know you must have read that scripture that said um, that we should, we should depart from every filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And you must have studied your Bible to find out what exactly can we consider filthiness of the spirit. Has it troubled you before? It troubled me for many years. <laughs> oh, if it has not troubled you, then let's leave it till it troubles you very much. I, we'll leave that one till it troubles you. Then maybe when you stumble on it, and then you are troubled to find out what exactly does the Bible refer to as filthiness of the spirit. Can the spirit become filthy again? Because Christ already is dwelling in your spirit. Can it still become filthy? I assure you it can now let me show you, give you a sign so that you understand that. Anything that quenches the spirit, the rise of the spirit, anything that quenches it is spiritual field. Let me give you one. Anger can quench it. You can be under the anointing strong like this and then suddenly you anger too comes and two of them collide. The anointing will go down. That's from your spirit. Bitterness can quench the spirit. Are you with me? Uh, Moses. Moses, you know, the guys were complaining, the guys were complaining, and because of that complaint, he now went and disobeyed God. Because his spirit was affected. Do you realize that you can be under pressure and that pressure can lead you to an action that will eventually end up in you offending God. Quench not the spirit of God. Quench it. Do not quench it. But as the process of sanctification continues because you give ventilation to the life of God on your inside, you begin to notice that there's a shift. There's a shift. And the true definition of sanctification, or the true purpose of sanctification, is that God wants to saturate your spirit. He wants to saturate your soul. He wants to saturate your body. That's what... Okay, let, let me cool down. I will take a complete day to teach holiness. The, the purpose of sanctification is that God wants to saturate your entire being. All right? So that he can think through your thoughts. He can speak through your vocal cords. He can pass through your hands. Because he has possessed all of your chambers. He has influenced all of your perspectives and philosophies that are not in line with his thought pattern. He has touched every aspect of your character that is not a projection of his reality. So he keeps working and the sanctification goes on and goes on. And all of that is sponsored by the power of the endless life. Two questions. So, sorry, before you ask the question, please go and study. There are still two. We just finished number one. Meanwhile, there are three things that um, Christ is doing. Right now in heaven, first of all, he's a priest. That's the only one we have finished. 
Then number two, he is the minister of the true tabernacle. That one we cannot touch it. That's why I told that sister yesterday, they don't read verse 2. He's the minister of the true tabernacle. Those are your scriptures that you read to us, Joshua. About that angel that mixed prayers with incense. Go and find out who that angel is. Because he's the minister of the true tabernacle. The real altar is in heaven. So as your prayers are saying, there's something that he does in the heavens. He's the minister of the true tabernacle. And that's the tabernacle that the Bible speaks about, that it was not pitched by the hands of man, but it was pitched by God. Just to make us understand that it's not talking about the one that was built on earth. Saying that that one that was built on earth is a mirror image of that one which is in heaven. And he is the minister of that tabernacle. Now we don't have time to go into that because it will take too much time and the whole week will be spent and will not enter into the subject matter which is the work of the ministry. Number three, he is enthroned. Oh, let me give you scriptures for minister of the true tabernacle. But after the conference, we'll come back to it and we'll continue from there. Okay? Hebrews chapter 8 verse 2. You will see uh, this is the one I would have loved to teach so much because of the current dealings I've had with the Lord in recent times. To open your eyes to the realities of the heavens, you can actually live the life of heaven here on earth. You can be reinforced by heaven, empowered by heaven, and the purpose of heaven prospers in your hand without any limitation, irrespective of circumstances, nationality, tribe. We know how to tap into the resources of heaven. Your life will bring forth the very predictions of scripture. And the equations of God concerning your life doesn't involve the devil. The devil is not part of it. Irrespective of Satan, your life will command as much deliverance unto Jacob. So number three, he's enthroned for God's administration. Oh, did I give you all the scriptures for the other one? Hebrews 8, 2. Hebrews 9, 8. Hebrews 9, 11 to 12. Hebrews 9, 24. The minister of the true tabernacle. The minister of the true tabernacle. Number three is the one enthroned for God's administration. The one enthroned for God's administration. All of God's plans and purposes are bound on Him. Should I, should I show you that one in the book of Ephesians chapter 1? I think I need to show you that from Ephesians chapter 1. But we are rounding up because my time is up. 12 o'clock is the time. We have 30 more minutes to ask questions and pray. And then number 4, He is the great shepherd. All of this is doing in heaven. The great shepherd. If you study your Bible critically, Psalms 23 tells us about the shepherding ministry of Christ. And then if you study down and come into the New Testament, you are going to see three aspects of his shepherding ministry. You will see him as the good shepherd that lays his life down for the sheep. You will see him as the chief shepherd. Then you will now see him ultimately as the great shepherd. As the good shepherd, he leads us to salvation. As the chief shepherd, he leads us to sanctification and transformation. And as the great shepherd, he leads us to perfection. We don't have time for that. But he's doing, operating within the capacity of the great shepherd, he's operating within that capacity right now in heaven. And I will show you what he's doing in heaven to ensure that all of us attain to maturity in Christ Jesus. Because by the time we get back to Ephesians chapter 4, we are going to see that God has released the grace, the apostleship, the prophets, the teachers, to bring the entire body of Christ to a point of maturity in Christ. His mission as the great shepherd is to bring us 
the point of maturity. Do you realize that our generation celebrates immature Christians? Pastors program themselves to keep their congregation in a perpetually immature state so that they will be dependent on them and then they will use that to exploit them financially. That was not how Paul's ministry was. That was not how Jesus' ministry was. Because the great shepherd is seeking to bring us to perfection. Many times people have, have told me, if you keep on preaching like this, you'll be a poor man. Be poor. Hallelujah. They don't preach like this. We know what you are saying is true, but if you continue, we have we tried it before. But we now discover that if the people are not dependent on you, your finances are not secure. So you keep them in a perpetually mature state so that you begin to prophesy that next week something will happen, but so. But I studied my Bible, I found out that if somebody does not give anything willingly, the person is not in for a blessing. Okay? If he doesn't give it willingly, the person was robbed. And the greatest robbers are not on the streets of, of, of Benin. They are behind the pulpit. Because everyone that comes and sits under the ministry of Christ should be liberated with a view of being brought to a point of maturity in God. Do you get it now? Alright, so, um, let me just throw you a little light enthroned for God's administration. Amen? Please don't be tired of Bible study. That's all I'll be doing till I go back so that I will choke you with enough truth that will give you openings into the realm of the Spirit and have deeper fellowship with God. We have left the realm. Amen? We are, we are, we, the, where we have reached now, what we need is truth so that we can, you know, advance in God. Ephesians chapter 1. Then you ask your question. In Ephesians chapter 1, I want to begin to read from verse 1. Just follow me. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before Him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise and glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He has made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His, to his good pleasure, which He proposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather, please, Take note of verse 10 very critically. He said that in the dispensation of the fullness of times that they might gather together in all, in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Now, this is what God is doing all through time. Amen? In the whole of time, what God is doing is bringing everything under the authority of Christ. Did you get it? You are not with me. Are you still here? I said in the whole of time, what God is doing in the whole of time is to bring everything, every dominion, every throne, every man under the dominion of Christ. That's what He wants to achieve. Both of things in heaven, and of things that are in the earth. So when a man gives his life to Christ and God begins to live inside of him, God has one mission. He wants to bring to the, the man to that point where the man totally submits to Christ. 
the full plan and purpose of God will be obstructed as long as that man is not absolutely yielded to Christ. Why? Because Christ, in his capacity as a Christ, is enthroned as the administrator in the heavens, vested with the responsibility of manipulating everything according to the counsel of God's will. Right. So, you have yielded to him. You have submitted your life to him, submitted your will to him. Now he begins to manipulate your life according to that which has been written concerning you. You may not know what he's doing now, but he's manipulating it. He's manipulating it. As long as you are under his authority, he's manipulating it. And then you begin to discover that the things that God revealed to you about your life, a time will come, begin to step into those things. Not because you were making any effort to fulfill them, but because Christ that you have yielded to is manipulating your life and bringing you in conformity with that which is written concerning you. If you ask our sister here, Sister Anguba, do, did you ever think you would be doing PhD while you were doing your first degree? Did you ever imagine it? But that is the destiny that God has written concerning her, and as she yielded to God, that destiny just started finding expression. People that live that way don't need prophecy. Because whether you prophesy it or not, it will still come to pass. Because they are under his authority and he's manipulating them according to the counsel of his will. And prophecy reveals his purposes. You get it? So when you receive prophecy, it only confirms what you know that you are going to experience. Because you are under his authority and he's manipulating you with respect to his counsel. And those things that are written concerning you will ultimately find expression. It doesn't matter. What I'm saying is, not dependent on where you are from, your, the poverty in your family. Forget about that. It will happen. If the things that have happened to me have happened, irrespective of my lack of qualification, and God spoke about it many years before it came to pass, what are you troubled on? The only crisis is for us to come under his authority. He will manipulate it. He will manipulate it. I've seen a lot of guys that followed God wholeheartedly for a season, and when they felt as if God was not coming through, they now broke camp with God. And when people are tempted to break camp with God like that, they are just close to a shift. He broke camp with God, and then tried to struggle. Then he struggled for another five years. And then he met futility, had near miracle syndrome, near miracle syndrome. He came to me and said he wanted to contest for counselor. That is, people just love him. People just love him. That's not his call. It was never written that he would be a counselor. Suddenly, he's everywhere with posters. I said, Tracy's have already volunteered to print his poster. That my own, this is nice, hand B. My own part of the whole, this is. I, I said, oh, hand B. Take money, do hand B. When he lost the election, he didn't even have courtesy to come back and say, bros. He just took off again. And then I saw him in BSU. Huh? What are you doing here? I said, ah, you, know, you don't know. <laughs> I'm in 200 level now. He just parambulating like that until he becomes old. Just because he has refused to submit himself to the authority of the Christ to manipulate his life according to the counsel of God's will. Please, let that not be your story. Let that not be your story. Before we came into ministry, Older ministers threatened us. They say, Hey, you want to come where? To ministry. Hmm. Go back and let your father diagnose you that you are okay first. That we, here, is only by the grace of God. So we have this here. Ministry. That the devil that you have been shielded from will hunt you with naked folk. That's what we're told. Until a time came, I became weary of hearing men. And I'll find, that's why I prayed much, because I wanted to secure his will. And then I walk in it, and walk in it, and walk in it, and walk in it. And ten years later, those people that said that thing now came to me and said, God has given you a kind of wisdom. 
But they didn't tell me that that wisdom was available before. Please, don't, don't listen to any man that will discourage you along the line of your destiny. If you are walking on that path that God has called you to, uh, to walk, even in the worst of times, if you are sincere to yourself, you will know that God was there and His support was present. Even in the worst of times. And as you operate under the authority of Him that has been enthroned to administer the purposes of God, you just begin to see that your destiny will begin to break up. It will begin to break up. And nothing will be able to stop it. Nothing will be able to stop it. As you walk with God, be faithful to Him, yield to Him. Nothing will be able to stop it. Do you realize I found out that the best in the class doesn't eventually end up being the greatest? So just in case you, somebody got through one first class in your class and you say, Hi, ah, it would have been me. You see, God didn't see. It wasn't necessary for you to have first class. For that which is weaving out of your life. And if God still wants you to be a lecturer, we even without that first class, He will still weave your way, weave your way, weave your way. And He manipulates everything according to the counsel of His will. Now, we are going, and all of these are operations from the heavens, which are the installations in place in the realm of the spirit reinforcing our ministry here on earth. So, I'm just trying to open your eyes to see that you can't fail in that which God has called you to do. It's not possible. The administration, the resources in place to ensure that it comes to pass are stronger than anything that your eyes have seen and your ears have heard. Are you still with me? So ask your question now. The strong eventually in every generation did not start out as the strong. Because when we were on campus, there were people that were stronger than me, plenty. Hallelujah. It is good for you to, be, for you to have a deficiency so that you will be able to trust God to help you. It is the one that used to God more that becomes God's number one. I have seen five years make strong men charlatans. Make weak men strong. Praise God. Hallelujah. I, I believe in the Please, are you, are you here? can you hear her? Put, put the mic here like this. Okay. okay. I, I believe in that, what you said, that when you submit to the power of God, to the authority of God, it sanctifies you. It transforms you to what Transform. God wants you to be. But yeah. my problem is I've seen people okay. that have come to God, that have actually come out, received altar calls, and they are still in churches. Okay. But... There's no transformation. You, you, you don't see any transformation. And let me tell you, the reason is because they are not submitted to God. Coming to church has nothing to do with your submission to God. Check your life. I've always said it. Check your life. Did you obey the last instruction that He gave you? Or are you still on it, struggling to receive grace to obey? Those guys coming. I told you, is it not here I said it, that we have developed statistics about the church in Nigeria and only 5% are submitted to God? Did I not tell you? Is it not here? 90% of Christians in, 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 in Nigeria are immature and look, you, trying to use God's power as a magic wand to serve their own purposes. That's the same thing people do when they go to visit native doctors. They don't tell the native doctors, want to serve your God. Though. That spirit, want to know Him. They say, just use the, the spirit and give us what we want. That's what people come to church to do. Now, it has produced a generation of immaturity where the knowledge of God is dying. That's why we need to stand and teach the truth and raise people that will fill in the gap because the gaps are too many. They are not submitted to God though. They just want to use God to fulfill their dream. Especially in churches that teach economics and the privatization and commercialization. They privatize and they commercialize gospel. How you can translate God and value Him in terms of Nara and Kobo. Why would that guy want to serve God? Because God is 
his errand boy that is available to him to work for him to make him produce Nara and Kobo as the end product of his spirituality. Should I tell you something? It's what people hear that determines what they become. If we have error in the body of Christ, an erroneous generation that do not know God is going to evolve. That's where the true battle is. The battle that has defined the line of our call. We are called to preserve this generation from decay because the devil has planned 10 years ago, 10 generations ago, to crystallize the generation that will not know the true God but will still have his name Jesus on their lips. And God has sent us into the harvest to preserve that generation that that cause will never come upon us. And it's so wonderful to be part of that labor. And God will stop at nothing to ensure that our voice reaches the ends of the earth. They are not serving God though. Even pastors. Have you not seen pastors that are in into ministry that are there because of themselves? That's not ministry. It's fake. And that person might have started genuinely. But situations and pressures created a new mold, created a new perspective, and then he has evolved to become something else. The question I'm going to answer at the end of the conference is what happens when that which God starts becomes corrupt? I will answer that question. Yes, any other question before we go into prayer? No more question. Yes, the lawyer. That, the, that thing you whispered, just say it. Don't say it behind the chair. Give her the mic. She's whispering behind the chair. Meanwhile, there's a microphone. I was actually not asking a question. Yes. You said at the end of the conference, you are going to tell us what will happen if a minister misses that which he was, supposed to, which he was called to do. Okay. And what will happen to his ministry. So I said, should you help me write it down so that after the conference, if you forget, we will remind you. If a minister that. misses that, do you realize that if you are working with God consistently, eh, when you are missing it, you will know. When the level of your spiritual input is not sufficient to carry you on the level that you are, you will know inside your spirit that I am operating below capacity. And the Holy Spirit will keep disturbing you, keep disturbing you, keep disturbing you. And if you still have half, half a resolve in your heart to serve Jesus, you will cry out. Actually, actually, that is the true purpose for marriage. Because your wife will know when you are about to fall. Yes, we have singles conference Saturday evening, Sunday evening. 5 p.m. Two hours of no praise and worship. Singles conference. I don't know how you are going to spread the news, but spread it everywhere. Singles. Let's what is marriage? You are, you are looking for a damn set. What is it? What is marriage all about? From God's perspective. Before we go into courtship and how to handle this and handle that, and let's find that first. Uh, Saturday, 5 p.m., Sunday, 5 p.m. If we don't finish after the conference, we'll, we'll continue. Yes, this Saturday. This Saturday, 5 p.m., Sunday, 5 p.m. I don't know how you will. We don't have hand bills. We don't have any means of inviting people. So, I don't know. Or if it, if it can't work, we can shift it. Can it work? Okay, if it can work. Because God gave me an instruction from Lagos that when I come back, I should do a thorough teaching and give practical examples. There are so many variables in the equation. So many variables. And... Um, it happens to be a subject that any question that is asked doesn't have a ready yes or no answer. It's very technical and at every point in time we must operate by the present revelation position of the Spirit. And I trust that God will bless us in the name of Jesus Christ. Can we pray? We have just uh, 10 more minutes to go. Can we pray? Now if you understand the operation of Christ in the heavens, you understand the reinforcement that is enforcing that which God has ordained you to become. Uh, wait, wait, before you pray, wait. Um, 
You know Sunday Buche? You know how many years he was in that jungle before his head came out? Do you know he has done about 18 years in ministry now? And he's, every, he's in the U.S. now. They don't want him to come back. Do you know that a normal man cannot remain in that village for 18 years? If you are not receiving reinforcement from heaven. But by the way people judge things, there were many times that he, you know his wife died, died in the process. He vowed that he won't marry again. His friends that came and laid hands on him and said, you must love again. Because we cannot have a light, a prince like this, grow to this level. And then there is a loophole that the devil can exploit. Not because they did not know he was a disciplined man. Do you understand? And they laid hands on him to love. You, you will love him. He didn't change his location. He's still in the bush. He's the number one preacher in Kogi State. People have come. There are bishops there in Kogi State. They have made noise, made noise, made noise. But you will always know a city that is set upon a hill. See, let your life not be involved in rat race. God is looking for young princes, but he will train us. He won't take us and cross one step. Young princes that were able to stand at the gate again because the elders have ceased from their music. Voices within territories that can hold the position and the perspective of God. People that he can send into government and he will be sure that his kingdom will be represented adequately. There is a dealing he will give us. There is a preparation that you will receive from him that will make us... See, Mm. Let's stop there today. I don't know whether you consider your Christian life to be something precious, something a project, or you just say, Oh, me too, I come, me too, I stay, you know, and all of that. Don't waste your time. It's a project. If Jesus had to die for it, then it's serious. It's something that we must hold dear to us. And God is working so much to extend his kingdom, and we are going to be his full soldiers. In Jesus' name. Can you rise up and put your right hand on your chest? As we pray prayers of... We are not exactly what He wants us to be yet, but we're constructing something in our lives. We want to ask Him for grace. For grace. For help. For enablement. Because it is true, it is certain, that the mighty will rise from our midst us. Grace is what we need. Grace is that which we request from thee. Lavish upon us your grace. Open unto us the window of grace. Help us. Cause your face to shine upon us. Grace. 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 Grace, Lord. In Jesus' name. Our generation is that generation that is a generation without a pulpit. Because every, you will find prophets in the bank. As you are going to withdraw your money, the man says, that dream you had in the night that took sleep from you, then you will stop this. Then he will count you. <laughs> oh, Jesus, Jesus. We want to release missionaries into every strata, every facet of human endeavor. So that if you, if you stay long enough in BSU, you should meet some lecturers that have been galvanized by God. And they will impact more your life than the course that you came there to read. So you will know eventually that you went there to meet those people not to read that course. But all the same, you came out with a paper. But their dealings with you have pedestaled you to bring about an impact in your generation. God wants to raise samples. That people will look upon and receive caution. People will see and the lawlessness in them will be judged. As you take a high sense of responsibility, as we latch on to the provisions of God to represent Him accurately. And I know that you are that man. You are that woman. Give Him praise, give Him glory. Exalt His name. Because even in this conference, the Lord has told me that His window of grace will be open. His window of grace will be open. Window of grace will be open. When David was to contend with Goliath, he said, Let no man's heart fail him. 
Don't fear for me. Don't have hypertension for me. I'm secure in God. I'm secure in God. I'm secure in God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.